Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to this talk. I'm Claudia Diaz. I'm uh, an assistant professor at the uh, COSI group in the Kyle Levin Department of Electrical Engineering and I will be giving a very short introduction to privacy technologies in this talk. So an outline of the talk. The, the main idea is to put in contrast two, two popular approaches to, to privacy in, in technology and one is uh, the data protection approach and the other is what I call the privacy enhancing technologies approach. So I will be for each of these uh, discussing a little, I will explain a little bit what are the assumptions, what are the goals and give some example technologies that uh, follow that approach. I will spend more time on the second part, the privacy enhancing technologies and there I will talk about two main approaches and these are not the only ones but the most uh, typical ones of uh, to, yeah, to improving privacy in um, online systems and one is focused on, on anonymity properties and the other does not require anonymity. And then I will summarize uh, the main characteristics of uh, each of the two approaches and, and conclude. Okay, so just to, to get started, some privacy is, is a very complex and subjective issue. Uh, it can be uh, thought about in many different ways. Um, some of the popular definitions uh, of privacy is as the right to be let alone, uh, which is focused on, on protecting individuals from intrusion by other uh, by states or by other people or corporations or whoever. Another approach is informational self-determination. This comes from the German data protection tradition and this is very much focused on privacy. You have privacy when you have control over your information, when you can decide who can see your information and what they can do with it and so on. And uh, a more recent uh, definition is uh, privacy is the freedom from unreasonable constraints on the constructions of, of one, one's identity. So this is about others somehow restricting the, one, the, the way you construct your own identity. So for example, if you have uh, profiles that are being inferred from your activities and, you, and then you're confronted with these profiles in the sense that decisions are made about you that somehow constrain, for example, what information you have access to or what opportunities you have access to, this would be seen as a privacy infringement. So this is uh, popular definitions. Most of them come from the, the, legal, uh, from the legal background. Um, Daniel Solovey, who's a legal scholar, uh, has a, a paper on uh, taxonomy of privacy and he argues that privacy is not one thing but many different properties or many different things that are not necessarily uh, related to each other in a formal way but they, they bear a resemblance to each other. And he identifies 16 different types of privacy threats, of privacy violations, and he classifies them into four groups which is information collection, information processing, dissemination and invasion. So this is another perspective and yet another perspective is from, a, from computer science engineering uh, dis uh, yeah, discipline in which privacy is typically formalized as uh, system properties and, uh, and there we talk about uh, systems that provide anonymity or a linkability or an observability and so on. So I will start with the data protection approach uh, as you probably know, there is a directive in the European Union uh, that establishes uh, yeah, a data protection directive that then is implemented in the different member states in the EU and it has certain principles. So one of the principles is that when data is collected uh, about individuals, uh, the entity collecting the data has to define the purpose. So you, cannot, you, you have to collect data for a specific purpose and the data that you collect must be proportional in the sense that it must be adequate and relevant for the purpose that you have defined and you should not collect any data that is not relevant for that purpose. So this is sometimes um, called the data minimization principle, although this is, has come later, it's not specifically in the directive. Uh, other principle is uh, that the, the subject, the data subject, which is the person to whom the data relates, must be aware of this data collection and must provide consent. So it has to agree to this data being collected. Uh, once the data has been collected, the subject, the, the individual, also has certain rights, which is called uh, data subject access rights. And this means that you have the right to see what data about you has been collected, uh, you can correct it if there is anything wrong, you can ask for deletion as well. And then the entity collecting the data has certain obligations and these are mainly data security obligations so they have to ensure that the integrity of the data, the confidentiality of the data and so on. They have to keep it secure. 
And one thing that is very important is that data protection only applies to uh, what is called uh, personal data. So this is a very restricted subset of the data that uh, organizations typically collect in the sense that if, for example, names are removed and other obvious identifiers are removed, then the data is considered anonymous and then data protection does not apply. So all these uh, safeguards are uh, out of the scope. <coughs> So what are the assumptions? So there are technologies, and I'm going to first focus on these, that try to sort of uh, implement technologically or assist technologically in the implementation of data protection. Okay? That, that the systems, that, that the organizations that collect data are somehow compliant with this data protection. How can technology help with this? So the assumptions in these uh, data protection technologies are several. So the first is that the collection and processing of personal information is useful and is necessary. And there are many cases in which we can all agree that this is the case. So, for example, if you are following a treatment in a hospital, they need to have your health records, or the, the government needs to have tax records and keep tax records, so they are going to have the need to uh, keep information about individuals, and this is generally seen as, um, as, a desi as desirable in our society. Uh, another assumption is that these organizations that are going to be collecting and processing the data have an interest in providing not only reliable services, but also they have an interest in protecting the privacy of the individuals uh, that relate to the data that they collect. So there are very strong trust assumptions in these technologies uh, in the sense that, for example, if you, are, um, if you have like some sort of interface to express preferences on for which purposes you allow the data to be used, then uh, the organization is trusted to respect these settings and not to use the information for other purposes. And generally, the, 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 sort of the, the, the privacy threats that are addressed by these technologies is that uh, the problem is not the data collection. Data collection is okay. Data collection is, is useful, is desirable. The problem is that sometimes when data is collected, then it's used for the wrong purposes or is used in the wrong way. So it's all about information abuse and not information collection. So what are the goals of the te these technologies? This is uh, the, very much aligned with this idea of privacy as control of personal information. So the idea is that you want to provide individuals with means to control their own information. And for this, uh, you can have technologies that assist people in providing informed consent or that assist people in, in expressing what they want to happen with their data, such as privacy settings. And then uh, the technologies also aim to provide organizations with means to define security policies on what can and cannot happen with the, with the data and also to means to enforce that these policies are respected. Uh, it's not only about enforcing, but it's also about what happens when things go wrong. Well, either you want to prevent things from going wrong or you want to be able to detect that something has gone wrong. And uh, this links very much to the concept of accountability, which is gaining a lot of traction in the especially in the revision of the Data Protection Directive, which is that we need to be able to detect uh, that, that, something, that somebody has abused the data and we need to be able to react uh, against it. So what is the, the system model? Basically, we have a, a, a subject, an individual, that has some data that relates to, and some data that is uh, related to this individual. And there is some organization that in, in data protection language is called a data controller. Okay? So the idea is that the individual is going to uh, provide the data to the organization, to the data controller. The data controller might delegate <coughs> the processing of the data to uh, one or more data processors, which are organizations to which maybe uh, it outsources par part of the processing, and the data controller is trusted for the protection of the data. And what is the threat model that they uh, is uh, in, this, uh, in these technologies is either external parties, so some hacker that breaks into the database and steals the data, or yeah, some entity, external entity to the organization. It's also aimed to protect against errors, mistakes, uh, and in some cases, but not always, it also considers malicious insiders. So the organization itself is trusted to be good, but maybe there's some employee in the organization that is malicious, and therefore the, te the technology should be there to somehow uh, either prevent malicious insiders from doing something bad with the data or detect if somebody has abused the data. So, of course, these technologies are mostly aimed to the, to the organization. The user is typically not very much involved in, uh, in sort of the model of the technology. And what technologies, so for example, uh, policies, access control, audits, and so on, I will give now a very short overview of three examples. 
So one example is privacy settings. Privacy settings is effectively a, a, a policy. So in, this, in, in the case of settings that are configured by the user, which is the, typically the case with privacy settings, it's a means for the user to, to express preferences. So this is, for example, very popular in things like uh, social networks, so certainly that you can specify who can see your information and so on. So what kind of research is done uh, in, in privacy settings? Well, uh, the idea is that one of the problems with privacy settings is that uh, this is effectively a security policy or a privacy policy. And these are technologies that were defined for system administrators originally and uh, not for end users. So it is sometimes very difficult for users to understand what the settings mean, to locate the settings, to understand the consequences of uh, checking different options and so on. So a lot of the research is aimed at making them uh, more usable, at making them more, more meaningful, have the uh, a granularity that is useful for users to understand, uh, to express their preferences and so on. So some of the proposals are that uh, you can provide users, for example, for default suite, suits of privacy settings so that instead of having to configure from scratch, they can have like high privacy, low privacy, or public information uh, settings. Or uh, also automate uh, part of the configuration by having wizards that help the user, for example, keep the settings up to date when there are changes in the, in the system so that um, their, their preferences are migrated to, to the new configuration. This is one example. Uh, yeah, one thing that is important is that uh, the settings really is, are just about expressing preferences. That's the enforcement is done not by the user uh, herself, but by the organization. So the organization, again, is trusted to respect and these settings and, and make them ensure that uh, they are enforced. So another... Uh, uh, type of technology is, uh, um, uh, that can be used to enforce, to, to make sure that information is only used for the purposes for which it was collected is purpose-based access control. So if we have a policy that establishes not only who can access information but also for which purposes they can use this information, then we would like to enforce um, this policy uh, technologically and not just have organizational measures that ensure that we can, like, such, such, such as like a code of conduct for employees and so on. So you, you can do technologically, um, you can implement technologies that somehow check the purpose of a data access or data processing and check that it is compatible with the, the purposes for which it was collected that will be expressed in a policy. And then what if things go wrong? We need to sometimes you know, be able to verify that nothing bad has happened so uh, that the policies have not been violated. So often these auditing systems, what they do is that they log all the actions that have been taking place in the system and then they examine these logs to see whether there has been any violation, where some unauthorized party uh, um, accessed information or whether they used it uh, in the wrong way. Um, so one of the problems with, uh, with uh, these logging systems is that they generate additional information and this information might have also privacy implications. So uh, of you don't want to generate more information than necessary for checking the, that the policy has been respected. So how can we uh, log in a way that is minimal but is still sufficient to, for the purpose of the audit? And uh, I mean, in a way, this, th this is an approach that uh, tries to uh, improve privacy by putting in place a surveillance system, right? which is a bit sometimes contradictory, particularly when we see the other the second perspective, which somehow uh, makes more of um, puts these two concepts of surveillance and privacy more in, in conflict. Um, so some of the problems with uh, data protection technology is that in practice, uh, effectively, the user does not have any active control over the data. The controls are really uh, legal controls that organizations being liable if, if they do something wrong. But it's not that the user really has uh, any uh, power to control what is happening inside the organization. Um, and it, it is in practice very difficult to know what is going on inside an organization <coughs> in, sen in the sense that they are very opaque. They don't really, they, they are not really transparent about what they are doing with the data that they collect. Often these are even uh, sort of secret algorithms that they use. If you think about, I don't know, how Google might use, for example, your search queries to optimize their search um, 
services, then they, are, this, they consider this a, a company secret and it's not that they are willing to, to tell the world uh, what they are doing exactly with the information and how they are processing it, what inferences they are making uh, on it and so on. Um, so in practice, uh, it is very much trust-based in the sense that the, the, as, a, as an individual you need to trust these organizations that they are honest, that they are not going to be malicious or using the information to your disadvantage in some way. But not only that, even if they are honest, uh, they could be, well, I say competent here, but they could be, they could be security flaws in the system, they could be vulnerabilities that can be exploited so that they can be the victim of a security attack that then has implications for, for your privacy because your data was stored in their system. So some of the problems is that uh, data minimization, which is uh, following from this proportionality principle in the sense that you need to, uh, to, to not collect more data than necessary, is often ignored. And the thing is that there are many ways of thinking about data minimization. One is to um, sort of the more common sense intuitive approach that, I don't know, if you're subscribing to a newspaper, they probably don't need your health information. That's obviously irrelevant. But uh, as we will see in the, second in, in the next part with privacy, with the privacy enhancing technologies, one can take data minimization quite far beyond what, beyond what intuitively one would think is, uh, is necessary. So what there, there, there are ways, there are technologies that actually achieve a functionality with much less data than one would think is necessary. But this is typically not considered in the sort of data protection approach. Uh, another big problem is uh, the issue of consent. So basically, uh, to be compliant with data protection, uh, the organization needs to obtain user consent. But of course, um, obtaining consent is relatively easy in the sense that uh, typically users are going to be uh, presented with some uh, privacy policy that is long and difficult to understand and sometimes not very clear about what is uh, going to happen. Therefore, to what extent one can say that uh, the user is really informed when he's consenting to the processing of data. Um, it is difficult to understand what are the potential abuses in the sense that um, when you start thinking about inferences that can be made from data, maybe the data you're pro providing, like your supermarket shopping, is not, uh, does not seem so sensitive, but then you can analyze that and draw inferences, such as, for example, whether somebody might be diabetic or whether they have any you know, eating disorders or health information and so on. Even um, there was a recent, uh, well, recent, like about a year ago, I think, a, a case in which a supermarket, a supermarket in the U.S. Uh, was analyzing the purchases of people and inferring whether uh, women might be pregnant or not, depending on, on the buying patterns, right? So this can be considered quite sensitive information and one would not think that because somebody is buying certain creams or certain products, this is uh, <coughs> so private, but then when you think about the inferences, then it becomes, um, you can make inferences about much more private information. So to what extent, when you are consenting to the processing of your data, can you really know what is in that data that uh, could be private? And then, to me, the biggest problem is the lack of choice, in the sense that often it's take it or leave it, in the sense that either you consent to these terms of service or you get no service. And if you don't have uh, alternative services that are going to have a different privacy policy, then to what extent can you choose, or to what extent, you know, uh, because if you need the service, then you need to consent. Like, I cannot discuss with Electravel, for example, whether what information about me I want them to collect or whether I agree or not with how they treat my data because I need electricity, right? So this is a bit of a problem. And the thing with data protection is that uh, nearly anything is okay as long as you get consent. So it's a bit of a backdoor in the sense that you get consent and then you can do whatever you want because the user consented to it. And then another issue is the trust assumptions. Uh, are they realistic to think that um, organizations really have this big interest in protecting your privacy. And I think in the discussions, when, when I hear discussions about this topic, I have the impression that sometimes two things are mixed. So I might trust Google, for example, to provide me with relevant search, search results when I'm doing a query. Uh, and it is certainly in their business interest to have a, a, a service as good as possible. Now, to why, so their interest in providing a good service and my interest in providing, in, in getting you know, relevant search results are aligned. But when it comes to privacy, that's not necessarily the case. So uh, 
maybe my interest in them not learning things about me is contrary to their interest uh, of their interest in learning things about me to improve their service. So these trust assumptions that because you have a relationship with a provider and uh, they, they want to provide you with good service, I don't think that translates immediately to assumptions when it comes to, to private data. Then, I mean, securing the infrastructure is difficult, securing the data is difficult and it's, it's expensive, you need expertise, you need to invest money, so to what extent is it reasonable to, to have these strong trust assumptions that they will take care of everything and you don't have to worry, you just provide the data and everything is okay. Um, then uh, another issue is with uh, purpose, so uh, in privacy policies there is a tendency of, of defining purposes as broadly as possible so that they can use the data later on for something else. They develop a new service or develop, they start doing analytics of a different kind and of course they want to be able to, to use the data they have collected. So uh, this can be seen as a, fa as a way of, as a sort of function creep in the sense that to what extent the original purpose is still respected when uh, the data is start, is, becomes used in, in a different way. And then malicious insiders are not always taken into account. Um, so another issue is to what extent are these principles technologically enforced? So it is not sufficient to just have good intentions and to have laws to protect privacy. I mean, at least from a computer science perspective, one would expect that you have technologies that really become a barrier to abuse. But in, in many cases, data protection is addressed through mostly organizational measures. Right? <laughs> Uh, and then even if things go wrong, the penalties are typically very low, enforcement is not uh, very strong. Uh, so the ins this even diminishes further the incentives to really invest in, in securing the data. And we see that in the uh, number of privacy breaches in which customer records or health records are disclosed. This is happening on a daily or weekly basis and uh, yeah, we just have to take it. Right? Uh, and then another big problem is the, the, the issue of anonymous data because, so one of the problems is how anonymous data is defined. It is very easy to um, convince the data protection authorities that uh, data has been anonymized because you just need to remove sort of obvious identifiers like the name and the address and the national ID number, things like that. But the thing is that it is from, from behavioral data, from uh, other pieces of data that maybe in themselves on their own are not uh, directly identif uh, identifying the individual. When you combine them together, it is relatively easy to re-identify individuals. And there are many cases that uh, highlight this. So one is the, um, it's an old one, the AOL, American Online uh, Search uh, Queries. They published um, a list of search queries. They have removed the... Uh, the names of the people and the IP address, so it was just the, the block of search queries with the, the aggregated by the same person. And of course, by looking into the search queries, you could eventually identify who the person was. Right? But technically, that would be un considered anonymous data. Okay. Uh, and I mean, I don't know, many of you maybe are in Kyle Leuven. Uh, I don't know if you go to Ala for lunch. But if you do, now they, they are scanning the personal, our student cards and they have a notice uh, uh, paper that says that the, the, they want this to improve their service and so on, but, and that the data collection is anonymous. So some colleagues uh, were inquiring on what it means that the data is anonymous, and it seems that what they do is that they collect the card identifier, which, I mean, maybe it's, it's not your name, but it's, it's unique for you, so okay. They collect that with your meal, then they send that to Kai Leuven. Okay. Kai Leuven puts that in a database, so that means that Kai Leuven now has your meals for every day, right? And then Kai Leuven provides them with an interface so that they can query aggregate. So how many people from this department you know, are eating this or are coming to Alma this day or that day and so on. And it seems that they got permission from the Privacy Commission. Everything is okay, everything is compliant. While one would think that, I mean, this is it's quite counterintuitive that there are no any that there are no privacy issues in well, first of all how they got consent because nobody signed anything and, and then the fact that they are giving employers information about meals and so on. But still they can claim that it's anonymous and the privacy commission would accept it. So just to give you a sense of how loose, how easy it is, how low the barriers are in, in that sense. 
So some colleagues have tried to refuse, and of course the cashiers are saying, no, no, you have to do it. And I don't know what would happen if you really refuse, maybe you have to pay the, the higher price for guests. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, but that means that that third party now has yeah. sensitive information about you. I mean, you could start. I mean, if you are evil, you can start thinking about many things that you can do with that. You can see whether somebody is eating healthy or not, and maybe they are not eating healthy. You don't want to give them a permanent contract because you know maybe they are going to be sick more often than somebody who is eating differently. Okay, so not the meal information, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. According to the Privacy Commission, it's all okay. And it's all anonymous. <laughs> okay, so uh, what about a different approach? So, a bit the, the goal of this presentation is a bit because lots of people are working on privacy technologies. And mainly these technologies are coming from security. So you will hear, you know, instead of... To me, I mean, it's very difficult to make this distinction between privacy and security. And actually, it was mailing list. There was a big discussion about it, and nobody. I mean, it's very difficult to find like what is the defining characteristic. To me, and I'm not saying that this is uh, a general, generally accepted uh, way of, of distinguishing the two. To me, the difference is that privacy is security for individuals. So when we talk about security, it's typically we're typically referring to organizations, to companies, to governments, to organizations of, of some type. And when we talk about privacy, we are talking about having those security properties for individuals, right? Uh, and sometimes we want additional properties from the typical ones of confidentiality, integrity, availability. Uh, and privacy technologies sort of take this approach of how can we you know, provide individuals with hard security properties the same, uh, that, that follow sort of the same type of standards that we would want to have when we talk about security for organizations, that we have a threat analysis. and and we really see that uh, it is impossible to break the system or that it is not possible given a, a set of well-defined assumptions. So here the idea is not that uh, collection, data collection or data disclosure and subsequent collection is okay. That's not a problem. The problem is abuse of information. Here is not. Data collection is a problem already. So the idea is that the subject, the individual, should provide as little information as possible and as a result, reduce the need to trust the organization or the other entities as much <coughs> as possible. Okay? So the threat model is much stronger here. In, in the other case, the threat model was, okay, the organization is good and it's on your side and it's like external people or maybe one individual inside that are a problem. Here is, okay, maybe the organization I'm dealing with is adversarial. Maybe their interests are conflicting with my privacy interests, and therefore I want to have protection from them as well, not only from external parties. So uh, in, in these technologies, when they are designed, normally you should consider a strategic adversary that is motivated, that has resources, that is going to do his best to try to break the security properties of the system, which typically are learning information that the system is designed to conceal. This can be ident uh, your identity, for example, if we are talking about an anonymity technology. right? And, um, and the adversary uh, is, not, is, it, is strong in the sense that it's uh, not only the data holder, it can also be the communication provider if you're talking to the organization through the internet and so on. So what are the assumptions here in, this, uh, in, this, um, in privacy enhancing technologies? Uh, there is a, a sort of mistrust on, on legal measures and data protection in, in particular. So it's okay, organizations are not really transparent, <laughs> data protection enforcement is very weak, so we don't want to rely on that uh, as a first uh, line of defense uh, uh, when it comes to privacy protection. So, okay, once the data is under the control of the organization, it is very difficult for people to really check what is going on. So instead, we are going to prevent disclosure. Right? Uh, 
the second is misalignment of incentives. So it is not necessary that the organization is really, uh, has really such a strong interest in protecting my privacy as it is assumed in data protection, in which the organization is really the entity that is responsible for, for protecting your privacy. And uh, I, mean, I think this is reasonable, this assumption, in the sense that uh, uh, grabbing personal information is, is good for business. I mean, you can, you can extract value from that, right? And, and many of the big uh, new companies have built their, yeah, their, their competitive advantage in having you know, lots of uh, personal information. I mean, think of Facebook or Google or whatever. And also, if we read the news, the large number of, of privacy breaches does not give us much confidence in, in, in these organizations really being careful uh, with uh, their, how they handle our information. So if we want to uh, reduce trust, then we need to uh, minimize disclosure. And it's also important to see it's not only about uh, all the organizations are all evil and we should, you know, consider them adversarial uh, because, you know, they, they are against us or anything like that. It's not generalized paranoia. It's also about even if the organization is not evil in itself, it is so difficult and so expensive to really secure the data that one, the first line of defense should be that we don't provide the data if possible so that uh, they are, uh, so that uh, abuse cannot happen not only because they want to abuse but also because they are breached. So what are the goals here? This is uh, uh, of the popular definitions that I talked in the beginning. While data protection is very much aligned with this idea of control, that you know you give consent and then you can you know go and change the information and uh, and, and so on. Here is is very is much more aligned with the the older definition of privacy as the right to be laid alone. So the, having this autonomous sphere in which others cannot interfere, and these others include uh, organizations you interact with, but also the government and so on. Right. And then disclosure is, the idea is to, def to by default prevent disclosure or minimally disclose it in a way that is either not linkable to you as an individual. And this doesn't mean that people cannot disclose information. Uh, even if you're using uh, an anonymous anonymity system like Tor to uh, access, for example, a, a forum or, or a blog or something, you can still, nothing is preventing you from using this anonymity system to connect to some uh, blog, for example, and say, hello, this is Claudia, right? You, you can still disclose this information. It is that by default, it is not disclosed. And then it is your action that actually discloses it, right? <coughs> if we think about uh, technologies for social networks, it's the same. So some, there are many proposals for plugins, for example, for social networks, in which um, so the, the way it is now is that you rely on the privacy settings for in, in Facebook, for example, right? So you configure your privacy settings, you're putting a post, and then you can decide who should see the, your information. So all your friends, or maybe a subset of your friends, or maybe the world, or whatever, right? So uh, some of these plugins, what they do is that, but, but of course you express that preference, but then Facebook is the one enforcing it. So what the plugins do is that they empower you, in a way, to enforce this preference. So they rely on, on, on cryptography so that it's not only that you say, uh, you, you tell Facebook, please only show this to my friends, but you encrypt it for your friends so that Facebook actually doesn't get the information and only your friends can decrypt it, right? This doesn't protect you from your friends further sharing the information because they are the trusted recipients, so these technologies do nothing to prevent uh, that case. Because the, also the assumption is that once information is disclosed, you have no control over it, you have lost. So if you want to disclose information to your friends, that's fine, but then you're in their hands in a way, and, and there is nothing technology can do, that's the assumption here, to protect you. So too many strategies, and these are not the only ones. So it's, it's a bit just taking the big picture. So one is uh, uh, technologies that rely on anonymity. So in this case, the idea is that the, the service provider or the organization you're, you're dealing with or your recipient of your communication can observe access to the service, can accept, observe your actions in the service. If you're, for example, browsing a web page, the web page would be able to see you know, which links you click and uh, which information you download and so on. But the, the privacy protection comes from concealing the identity of the user. So basically you decouple identity from actions and the actions are visible and the identity is concealed. This is one approach. And the other approach is a bit the opposite. 
So the identity might be visible, you might you know, fully authenticate and sign with a public key that is in your ID or whatever, or pay with a credit card that has your name on it. But then what you, go, you, what you do is that you conceal the actions that, that take place within the service. And I will give some examples of this. But um, you can, for example, search without revealing the keywords that you're searching for and the result that you receive and so on. I will give examples. And of course, uh, you not only um, ensure these privacy properties, you also have to ensure other service integrity properties. So uh, if there's potential for cheating in the system, then it should, the, the protocols or the technologies should ensure that cheating is prevented or detected. Right? And I said this, these are the two main approaches, not the only ones. There are other approaches I'm not really speaking about. One of them is fuscation. So here the idea is that you sort of pollute uh, um, the system with fake information. Okay? So one example of this, I don't know if you're familiar with it, is Track Me Not. Uh, this is a plugin um, for search that basically generates random, ser automatically generates random ser search queries right? and sends them to Google or to the search engine that, that you're using. What is the purpose here? The, the idea is that the, the threat is that they get, they, by analyzing your queries, they, they can construct a profile, they can make inferences about you. So what the plugin does is introduce noise, decrease the quality by introducing noise in this profile so that they don't get an accurate view of, uh, of your interests. But I will not be talking about obfuscation. Okay, so pets to achieve anonymity. So often when you are uh, when you're conducting a transaction, the first step of the transaction is authentication, right? So you first establish who you're talking to, who is the other entity, um, and uh, of course this this makes complete sense in an organizational environment. If you're an employee <coughs> and you're getting access to the you know to the company database or whatever it makes sense that they identify who you are. Right? But if, if we are talking about the internet, does it really make sense to have like, uh, this model that is very much uh, thought of for closed organizations in an open environment? So what are the problems of uh, having sort of the straightforward uh, authentication is that uh, if you're using uh, unique identifiers, such as for example your Belgian ID card that you can use to authenticate to, to different services, uh, that you, you have linkability across many different contexts and this can give rise to very sophisticated inferences. So if you want to have private authentication, there are two approaches. So first of all, who, is your, who, who do you trust and who is your threat model? If you trust your recipient and you want to reveal your identity, your like, let's say real identity, whatever that is, to your recipient, then you can ha use, uh, for example, just Fakin to hide against third parties that by observing the interactions they cannot tell um, uh, who you are. But you might also want to pr protect yourself from the recipient of your communication. You might want to authenticate, but in a way that you say, okay, I have certain properties that, m attributes that uh, authorize me to something, but I don't want to tell you exactly who I am. And this is anonymous credentials. So what's the idea uh, behind credentials is that very often you don't really need to know who somebody is. You just need to know some attributes of that uh, individual. Um, so for example, with ID documents, the state certifies your name, or your birth date and your address. So if you are, want to buy alcohol, for example, they might ask you for your ID to check that you're really uh, of age uh, and can actually buy the product. Or student cards that the university gives you, and maybe with that you can uh, obtain a discount in the cinema, right? Uh, and so on. But when you want to obtain a discount in the cinema because you're a student, it's not really necessary for the cinema to check your name or to check to uniquely identify you. They just need to know that you're one of the students and that therefore you're entitled to a discount. So this is sort of the, the type of systems in which anonymous credentials can help you have uh, privacy preserving authentication. So of course these this documents, these uh, this sort of certificates, typically have lots of information and often to have a specific transaction you don't need to show all of them. So they also allow for what is called selective disclosure. Right? So what's a credential is, is, is basically a token that certifies certain attributes uh, that allow you to prove to a verifier, so the verifier is to the, the entity with whom you're doing this transaction, that you hold a credential with certain properties, with certain attributes that is certified by the issuer, which is the entity that gave you the credential. 
so um, what can you prove with this uh, with this protocol? So they, they I think we have a picture here. Not sure. So basically, the issuer will give you the credential. You're the prover, and you want to prove your attributes to the verifier. And what can you prove? You can prove. You can either show uh, your attributes. So for example, if they say, "Show me your." Uh, date of birth, then you would disclose that, but not disclose other things that are also in the credential. Right? But maybe you don't even want to disclose your complete date of birth. Maybe you just need to prove that you're older than a certain age or younger than a certain age. So you would also be able to prove properties of the attributes and not only decide whether to disclose the attributes so in a binary disclosure or not disclose. You can, you can prove properties as well. So of course you, you want unforgeability, so you should not be able to generate your own credentials if, if somebody else is supposed to give this credential to you, so you should not be able to create your own uh, student card or ID card. And, um, and privacy, what does privacy mean here? So privacy here means that um, typically you're going to have uh, something that you want to prove to the, to the verifier and you these systems are set to provide privacy, you reveal no other information than this output that you want to prove. So if you need to prove that you are younger than 14 and a resident of Belgium, then the protocol should not reveal any other information than this. It should be impossible to learn anything else. And if that is fulfilled, then the protocol is set to be privacy preserving. And this, is, uh, this should hold even if the issuer who gave you the credential and the, vi the verifier to whom you show the credential, even if they work together and they combine all the information that they know, it should not be possible to learn anything additional about you. Uh, for example, who, who was the person that uh, uh, showed the credential. So this is a sort of PKI or privacy preserving PKI. How does it compare to, to standard PKI? So there are similarities and differences. The similarities is that you have a trusted issuer that is going to certify the attributes in the credential. So your name or your date of birth or country of residence or whatever. Uh, and this attribute is certified and this issuer is trusted to, to only certify true attributes. Uh, you're going to have a secret key in both cases. And um, this double signing detection is particularly <coughs> relevant for uh, eCash, which I'll, I will speak about next. Uh, now, what are the differences? The difference is that in PKI, when you have a PKI certificate and a certain number of attributes are encoded there, when you show uh, your credential, in this case the certificate, you show all of it. So, for example, if you use your, your Belgian EID card and it has a number of things, of attributes, and you want to sign a transaction, you have to provide your certificate to verify that the signature is, is correct and is yours. You cannot really decide to uh, conceal parts of the credential and show parts of the credential. It's all or nothing. You show everything that is in there. Well, in, in credentials, you can really not only, as I said, select which attributes you show and which you don't, but you can even prove properties about the attribute without showing the attribute itself. So, of course, in PKI, users are identifiable. And even if the name is not included in the credential, the fact that you have a public key that is going to be unique is, can be considered a sort of identifier. Okay? While in the other case, uh, in the case of anonymous credentials, you are able to show your credential multiple times to the same entity or to multiple entities. And it is possible to do it in a way that they are not able to tell that the, the, two, um, the two transactions were made by the same individual. Okay. Yeah. So one uh, example is uh, anonymous eCash, which is uh, uh, quite an old type of, of, of credential. So what is uh, anonymous eCash? So we would like to have secure and private payments. Uh, of course, it should not be possible for people to forge money or to forge payments, to create their own money. I mean, that would be nice, but it's not, uh, it's not one, the idea. But we would like it to be as anonymous as cash. So basically, you go to the ATM, you get some bills, you spend them in shops, and nobody can really think which that the, the person who withdrew money here is the person who spent the cash somewhere else. Right? So we would like to have that with electronic money. And cash is, is just one example, but you could also think of cinema tickets. You, you buy a ticket, and then you show, you, you show the ticket, and you don't necessarily want that these two things to be uh, linkable to each other. You think of transport, you can then track people if, if you don't use uh, this kind of technology. So how do uh, anonymous credentials provide this? So the bank is the issuer in this case. So I would go to the bank. The bank would, would subtract 
one euro from my account and give me a credential that says this is one euro. Okay? Then I go to the shop and I say, okay, I have one euro, I give it to you. And the shop is able to go to the bank and cash the euro and the euro is increased in their account. And as, as I said, properties and uh, forgeability so that I cannot create my own euros. And privacy in this case is that if the shop and the bank work together, they are not able to tell the person who took this euro was the person who spent this euro. Of course, if you're the only person using the system, then it's trivial to link the two. But if there are multiple people, then they don't know which of the people who drew money is uh, the person that spent the money. And then there is uh, this uh, double spending detection. So there's a big difference between paper money and um, electronic money. And with, ele with paper money or coins, if I give you the coins, a physical object, I don't have it anymore. Right? I, I cannot give it again because I don't have it physically. With electronic money, since this is really a string of bits and bytes, even if I give the money to you, I still can retain a copy of it and I could use it again somewhere else. So these protocols prevent double spending in the sense that um, one, one of the things you can do is, in this case, not prevent but also detect that if I use, if I give a, a euro to you and then I give it the same euro to somebody else, by combining these two transactions, the view that the two people have of the transaction, it is possible to identify me. Okay, so you, you would lose anonymity properties when you abuse the system. Now the nice thing about this is that it is sort of, abuse is sort of encoded in the technology. And in this case, abuse is defined as uh, double spending. So it is not like with policies sometimes that you say, okay, um, we will de decide what abuse means uh, later on, if we see something that we don't like, we will label it as, as abuse and then we will you know, go to some authority who can de-anonymize people just based on an arbitrary uh, decision. In this case, abuse is included in the technology. If you double spend, you will be automatically identified. If you are not double spending, then it would be impossible to identify you. Okay. okay, so another example, this is something we worked on uh, 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 in, in our group, uh, uh, a system for e-petitions. So um, I guess you all know what petitions are. You sign them to ask some authority to, to do something or to not do something. And uh, I mean, of course, petitions are, come from the offline world. Typically, uh, what you would do was, would be to deploy volunteers on the streets and supermarkets and so on, and ask people to sign. And for signing, they have to provide a name and some unique identifiers, such as the national ID number and then a signature. And then for verifying, uh, you would uh, count how many people have signed and you would have to detect as well whether somebody has signed multiple times or whether somebody has signed with fake identities that, for example, the name does not correspond to the ID number or to the signature. Right? And I don't know how they do it, but I think they, they, to, to do this, they do some random sampling and then they, they see like how many percentage is uh, invalid and I guess they extrapolate from there. And I, I, don't, I don't think they really check all of them, but I don't know. So of course this is very uh, cumbersome, it's very expensive. Um, it means you need to have volunteers to go out and reach out to people. Even if you want to sign the, peti the petition, maybe you are unlucky and you are not encountering people who are on the street asking for signatures. Uh, so it's, lots of resources are needed and the manual verification is also very tedious. So it would be nice if we could do it electronically. It would also be much easier for people to set up like initiatives and everybody to join in uh, from comfortably from their homes. So how do we? Okay. Wow. My God. Okay. I'll go. Yeah. Wow. I thought I was going to finish too early. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. So. Um, so very often when, when people think about taking some application or some system that is, exists offline and translating it online, there is typically a, a straightforward translation. And that straightforward translation is typically not very privacy preserving, but how would it be for, for petitions? So in Belgium, everybody has an EID, in many other countries in Europe is the same. So you, would, you could have people sign with the ID, they would go to some website, they would select some petition, yeah, I want to sign the petition, I don't know, for gay marriage, whatever, uh, and then you would insert your card in the card reader, you would type your PIN, um, 
and then it would be very easy because you have this unique number in the ID, it would be very easy for them to see, this, did this person sign already, yes or no? If they didn't sign, you count the, the signature. If they already signed, you say, okay, this, is the, this person signed already, we can forget about this signature. You count it or, disc or discard it. So now, what are the privacy risks of having this straightforward uh, translation of the offline petition system to the online petition system? Is that petitions typically can leak very sensitive information, particularly there because they, they often relate to controversial issues. So it, these are issues that in government initiatives or uh, sometimes private initiatives that people are, feel strongly for and against, and this is usually very political. Uh, so, I don't know, from things like uh, petitions for gay marriage or whether, you know, sometimes people complain about a mosque being built or they want a mosque to be built. So they have the relationship to things like uh, sexuality, religion, and so on. So they can leak very sensitive information. And uh, um, so that means that this sensitive information would be inferable. And because the, uh, you would be using something like the EID, this could be easily linked to many other things that you do, like to your taxes and to all kinds of other uh, activities. And the thing is that we, one could think, well, but you know, we have always done it like that offline. What is the problem of doing the same on, uh, offline? What is the problem of doing the same online? Well, because the properties of digital systems are not the same as, as the on offline world. So in the offline world, to really um, have privacy problems, first of all, you will need to, have to gain physical access to, to these uh, papers that with signatures. And they are going to normally be in some building, in some uh, drawer. Uh, maybe the drawer has a key. So there's some physical security. The accessibility is much lower. If you want to search, it is, you cannot easily just type a name and search whether the name is present in the petition. You would have to go through all the names. So there is a, a cost inherent to the paper-based system that makes it very difficult to, to, to do privacy infringements in the way that you can do online, in which copying the information is easy, publishing the information is easy, searching it, and so on. So this is you know, one argument why we, would, we might want to have um, um, anonymous petition signing instead of identifiable petition signing. So we think about requirements. Uh, okay, what do we need uh, if we want to have petition systems? What, what do we need really? So we need to know that this, the, we need to know how many people support uh, an initiative essentially, and for that the people should be uh, registered citizens, so they should not pretend to be somebody else. <coughs> and maybe they, there are some attributes. If there is a petition for Leuven, maybe only Leuven residents can sign, and people from other places should not sign because it's not their business, the initiative that is uh, being. Uh, uh, put forward, and, and of course people should only be able to sign once, and then you want all the valid signatures to be counted. And, um, and from a privacy perspective, in principle I would like to be able to sign a petition without uh, uh, being identified as such, so you need to know that a million people support this initiative, you don't need, really need to know who they are. Now one criticism that we got uh, with this paper was, okay, but Sometimes you want to go public, you want to say a publicly support, it's, a, it's sort of a public statement. I support this initiative because I believe in this, you know, cause or whatever. But this is not vented in any case. You can always publicize that you sign something and nobody would prevent you from doing that. So again, this is about default disclosure of information. By default, it's not disclosed. If you want to disclose, that's your choice and you can always do that. Is it <coughs> Uh, you prove that you have signed? Uh, I think if you publish a transcript, you can, you can prove. I'm not 100% sure, but I think if you publish, you can publish a transcript and, and prove that you have signed. But that is, anyway, I wouldn't think that's actually so important, but what is the point of publicly, uh, I mean, the, the strength of the petition is, is the, the big number, so is it a, a thousand people or a million people? And it would be very strange, I think, that somebody goes public and campaigns and and still doesn't sign, right? I mean, from a practical perspective, it would be very strange. I would think it's more the opposite, that maybe you want to sign something, but you, you might have peer pressure as well in your environment. I mean, imagine you're for gay marriage, but your family is ultra-conservative, or your village is ultra-conservative, and if they know this, then you, know, you might have like some, what we call social privacy issues uh, with them. So also to, to have people, to give people the ability to express themselves or to make statements in a way that they don't have to face consequences uh, in their immediate environment. Not only from the government or organizations, but it can also be the family or friends or whatever. 
So the, the way it works, uh, I mean, if we had like the EID with anonymous credentials, then we could directly use that. But since that's not the case, uh, the implementation that we have basically, um, you, you, we use the EID to obtain an anonymous credential. So this is to ensure that people only have one credential because if they have multiple, they, they would be able to sign multiple times. So you sort of authenticate, you obtain a credential, and once you have this credential from the credential issuer, then you can go to the petition or petition websites, so it could be one or many. You would select the petition that you want to sign and uh, sign it, right? And then there is a multiple sign detection that look, takes into account your credential and the petition identifier. So if you use the same credential with the same petition identifier twice, the same, uh, deterministically, the same number is produced at the end, meaning that you can check that two signatures are the same on the same petition. Now, if the if same person signs two different petitions, it is not possible to see that these two petitions, different petitions, were signed by the same person. So it's really like a double multiple signing uh, detection. And then you can publish the transcripts and then people can check that their petition is counted, their signature is counted. So, yeah, only the citizens that are authorized can sign, so they should have a valid ID, and maybe you can, and you can include, we didn't include that in the implementation, but you can, you can include like things like age or locality and so on. Important that only one credential per citizen is issued. So, uh, with this scheme, can you uh, query if a certain user has signed the petition? No. So you just combine the ID for petition and... The ID of a user? Yeah, so the input to the, to the protocol is the, the petition identifier, which can be a number or a string or whatever, is combined in the protocol. And then when you provide your signature, you prove that you included this uh, petition identifier and that these the signatures for that petition identifier. Mm -hmm. But then you cannot identify the user. The user is anonymous. That's true, but can you, if you have a user ID and you get all, all those... Uh, combinations of user IDs and... Yeah, but the user ID is not given, eh? No, but you might know it from somebody else, so... No, no, the user ID is the private key. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and we can... Yeah, multiple signing is detectable, and even if the issuer and, and, and server collide, you're still anonymous. Another important thing is that you need a, an anonymous channel to preserve this, eh? right? If you don't have an anonymous communication channel, then the protocol is wonderful, it works, but I can look at the IP and still link issuing and signature, or even if I don't see the issuing, I can just identify somebody by their IP address. If, so you still need uh, to protect that the communication layer. So uh, many, so uh, all these protocols, they assume that there is a, an anonymous communication layer below in order to provide the, the anonymity properties, right? In the sense that they guarantee the anonymity properties in the authentication phase, but that doesn't mean that in the lower layer you cannot identify people through IP addresses and, and network traffic. So in this case, for example, you would be able to link uh, this anonymous eCache protocol, for example, would not work. So what do we need to have like private communication channels? Well, I mean, of course, we want them to protect the confidentiality of the data and the integrity of the data, making any secure. Uh, traditional security, but we want additional properties. We want uh, uh, people to be anonymous, so the identity to be confidential, and then we might want as well relationships to be uh, confidential, and that means that two transactions by the same person are not linkable to each other. This is actually very important because if you have uh, anonymity but you have linkability of many different actions, then the combination of all those actions might result in identifiability. So you need protection against traffic analysis. So the way communication networks are designed are not, uh, they do not provide anonymity and unlinkability properties by default, so we need to do something if you want to uh, achieve that. Um, and uh, what we are trying to protect here is traffic data. So traffic data includes the origin of the communication, the destination of the communication, the time, the volume, and so on. And this can act as a side channel information. Right? Uh, so, of course, if you get traffic data, it's not the same as getting content of communications, which is much more rich and detailed data, right, semantically. So it's, it's very coarse, you just know that Alice is talking to Bob at this time of the day and they talked for half an hour. But nevertheless, it can be very highly valuable. One of the advantages of traffic data, advantages for the adversary, is that the format is machine readable and it's therefore very fast and easy to process. 
Um, and the way the infrastructure is designed, this, this is actually very difficult to conceal, this information. Then you can use information in that you call the traffic data, you can analyze traffic data and use that information to select targets, like if you can only break into a uh, limited number of people, uh, the computers of a limited number of people, then you can select who are the most interesting targets by looking at communication patterns. And actually, uh, Susan uh, Landau and uh, Whitfield Diffie in, have a book on wire traffic and they say traffic analysis and not cryptanalysis is the backbone of communications intelligence. So who's the adversary here? The adversary can be a third party, so maybe I want to talk to somebody and I want to actually authenticate to that other party because I want them to know that it's me. Uh, but I don't want other parties who might be observing uh, the communication channel to know that we are talking to each other. Or you can have also an adversarial recipient. So if I'm visiting a website, maybe I don't want the website to know who I am. So uh, an abstract model is that you want to conceal identity of sender or receiver or both, the relationship between sender and receiver. So you need to have like multiple senders, multiple receivers, and the idea is that it's not possible to pinpoint which of the senders is the, uh, the originator of, uh, uh, of an output of the channel or the other way around, um, which of the receivers is the actual re my actual receiver given that you see my input to the channel. So you need to do different things for this. Of course, you need to make the bit patterns uh, uh, unlinkable, so meaning that uh, by looking at, at what is the content of the communication, it should not be possible for me to just trivially see uh, which input corresponds to which output, but then that's easy. You just encrypt it in layers and so on. But you also need to destroy the timing characteristics in the sense that if, for example, this is a, a low latency channel and I send a, a message and you can observe input and output and I send, you see a message coming in and uh, a fraction of a second later a message coming out and you don't have enough uh, people sending at the same time to confuse these two events, then by time you can see, okay, this input corresponds to this output. So one of the, uh, the well not one, the, the most popular anonymous communication system is Tor. You probably have heard of it. What they use to achieve the, this um, bitwise unlinkability is onion encryption. So the way this works is that you select uh, three routers, and for this you first uh, download the keys of these routers from a directory service. Uh, you select three onion routers that are going to be in your path, and they are going to act as proxies between you and your destination. Uh, and you establish keys with each of these routers, right? So when you want to send a message to uh, a recipient, let's assume that you encrypt the message for the recipient as well. So first you encrypt it with the recipient key, and then you put that in an envelope that says this, this goes to destination D, and then in reverse order from the routers that you're going to traverse. So first you take the key of recipient three, and then you encrypt that uh, with the key of recipient three, and you say, okay, this goes to recipient three, and you do the same with the second uh, router and then with the first router. Okay. So this is layered. You have like one layer of encryption and then another one and then another one. So then what you do is that you send uh, this it has destination uh, recipient one and recipient one can decrypt this because they have the right key and then they see who the next hop is, in this case recipient two, sorry, router two. So the message is sent to router 2, who can, has the right key to the crypt, and then finds that router 3 is the next, and then destination. Okay. Then you can establish a bidirectional channel and send information back and forth between uh, sender and, and destination. So what is the threat model here? So the threat model could be your local ISP or somebody who's able to observe your local activity. So if, for example, you want to browse the internet and you don't want to your local ISP or your company to know which websites you're browsing, then that would be okay because they only have access to your local connection and that means that they will know that you're going to this Tor router, but they don't really know what happens after that. Um, if the middle router is compromised and, uh, the but the adversary does not have any other information than you know, this connection is passing through this router, then also that wouldn't be, they, they wouldn't break the, the properties. And if the adversary is only at the destination, so for example, uh, is the website itself or somebody who's monitoring the website and they want to know who is accessing this website, they will see that there is a connection coming from the exit uh, uh, Tor router, but they will not see who e originated that connection. Okay. Now, of course, if the adversary controls or can observe the three 
routers, then they can trivially uh, break the properties of the system. So it does not protect against this kind of adversary. And even if uh, they can only observe input and output, but not what happens in the middle, because because of uh, how the, uh, because yeah. Yeah, because uh, the number of packets in a connection, especially for HTTP, is so characteristic for each destination, in the sense that you download a page and it's going to have like different si elements in the page of different sizes. Uh, this is called a finger, it becomes like a fingerprint of the page. And because the space is so big of possible pages, uh, it is very easy to see that this uh, input communication corresponds to this output communication. If you had just a message, of a fixed length, this would not be a problem, okay? But because you have many packets in a certain shape with a certain timing, it is relatively easy to correlate. So if you can sort of input and output, it all will not protect you against uh, linking again the, the source and destination. So uh, I said anonymity was one approach. So in this case, uh, uh, for example, the news site can see the clicks and the, the, the news items that you click, but they cannot see your identity. But there are other approaches that do not rely on anonymity, and they are also very effective. So one uh, basic building block, is the only one is oblivious transfer. Um, here the idea is that uh, you have, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Alice that has two items, um, and Bob is allowed to download one of these items. Okay? So what this protocol will do is that Bob can select one of the items, and input it to the protocol, and Alice inputs the two items to the protocol, and then what the properties of the protocol is that Al, um, Alice does not learn which was the item chosen by Bob, and Bob does not learn the item that he did not choose. Okay, and this is like a very basic uh, setup, then you can generalize to more items and, and so on. So one example is uh, retrieving location-based content, so imagine that I have a, uh, some application that would be implemented with this, and I want to download, uh, you know, restaurants in Leuven. So I would select Leuven as my uh, as my my item. Imagine that they have a full map of Belgium, and I select Leuven. So I am able to retrieve the information for Leuven, but the provider would not know which town uh, information, yeah, for which town I downloaded the information. Okay, they would not know if it was Leuven or Brussels or Ghent or whatever. And I would not learn, imagine that I'm only allowed to make one of these queries per day and I'm not allowed to learn, you know, I can only learn for one locality. <coughs> so they would also have the assurance that I did not get information <coughs> for other towns. So oh, this is, doesn't look good. So I, uh, a colleague also developed a, a system for this, for previous purchases for uh, digital content. And here the idea is that you would authenticate, you would have an account with the vendor you would pay with credit card or some non-anonymous payment, and you would sort of prepay some amount. So imagine you say, I put 20 euros in my account, so I pay 20 euros. And now I have sort of, uh, I can spend up to 20 euros. So the way it works is that I would somehow select items. So these are digital content, it could be songs, or it could be, um, I don't know, newspaper articles, books, or whatever. And they could have different prices, each of them. So what, I'm, what the protocol does is that I am able to retrieve one of these items and prove to the vendor that I'm paying the correct price. And paying here means that I'm, I deduct from my sort of credit the right amount that corresponds to the item I'm downloading. And I prove to the vendor that my credit is still above zero, meaning that I didn't consume all my credit. Okay? But they do not learn which item I'm, I'm selecting. Right. So this is... I think this highlights that when in data protection people talk about data minimization, right, the, and, and, and not collecting data that is not, uh, you know, necessary for the transaction, they are not having this in mind. They are not having in mind that I'm able to, for example, buy items without revealing what the item is and they still give assurance that I'm paying the correct price and that the, the vendor is getting the right amount of money. This goes much beyond intuition. Uh, for, for, for this to be required, actually, by, by the data protection uh, legislation. It's much more limited. It's really about common sense. It, but this knowledge is really push. the need to know, they reduce the need to know in very unintuitive ways. <coughs> Another example is private search. 
So you can have, uh, for example, Alice to store some documents and Bob wants to retrieve documents that match a keyword. Right? This is a different protocol. So uh, here what, how it works is that Bob is going to provide a dictionary that has a keyword and some encryption. And if the keyword is of interest, then the encryption will be the encryption of a, a one. And if it's not, a, the encryption of a zero. Alice takes this dictionary and processes her documents in a way that the documents that do not contain uh, the keyword of interest will be sort of transformed into zeros. And the documents that do contain keywords of interest will not be transformed into zeros. They will be preserved. The content will be preserved. And then she uh, returns to Bob a buffer that will contain, she doesn't know what it contains, but the buffer, when Bob decrypts it, will contain the documents of interest, meaning the documents that contain the keywords. So the properties here are that Bob uh, uh, gets the documents that he is interested in. Alice does not learn the keywords. She does not learn the results of the search, although she's making the processing. Right. So in this case, this is another example in which Bob is not necessarily anonymous. I mean, you could combine anonymity with this as well. Right? But Bob is not necessarily anonymous, but you have very strong privacy guarantees by concealing sort of the behavior or the, the other details of the transaction uh, that are not identity. So the other approach is that Alice sees the keyword, sees the results, but doesn't see Bob's identity. So this would be like uh, two different approaches. I'm not sure I have time to, how much time do I have? Uh, 10 minutes. I think I'm going to skip this one because it would take long. This is a system that was also developed by people in our group up for um, electronic toll, toll pricing. So basically that you pay as you drive instead of paying a, a, a fee per year that is uh, based on the type of car that you have, then you would pay depending on how much you use roads. Okay? And they want to implement this. I don't know if now with the crisis maybe they have delayed it, but they, they were quite keen. The straightforward implementation, I will actually talk about it very shortly. Straightforward implementation is I have uh, a device in my car, this is the OBU, onboard unit, okay, that receive, uh, receives information from the GPS, okay, so knows its location, transfers its location to the toll service provider, which is the, the organization of managing the system. The toll service provider will do the map matching, saying, okay, these GPS points correspond to you know, the highway, so the price for this highway at this time of the day is so much. So, you know, I take note of that, and at the end of the month, I compute the bill, send you the bill, and you pay. Okay, this is one possibility. Of course, the problem is that detailed <laughs> location information allows for very fine-grained inferences. Um, are you going to the hospital? Are you going to some you know, political organization? Are you going to the demonstration? Or so on. So if we think again, like, what data is strictly necessary? What is strictly necessary here is that you pay the amount that you have to pay at the end of the month. Uh, and this is the actual purpose of the, of the system, that you pay according to your use. It's not the purpose to put a system in place that can track everyone uh, and uh, everywhere they go. Um, and of course you don't want people to cheat, so the, the alternative system that was uh, proposed by some colleagues uh, was to you receive the GPS uh, in your box, you do the map mapping, the map matching yourself, you see where you are, how much you have to pay, you aggregate uh, the amount that you have to pay and you tell the provider, hey, I have to pay this amount 30 euros. Okay? And then they send you the bill and if you say, oh, this is too much, then you can still access the detailed data with a, with a USB from the, from the device. So you are able to get your own data, but you don't send it to the, to the provider. Of course, this is a, uh, these type of systems in which the user is the adversary with respect to service integrity are very difficult to secure. And in this case, it's not about tamper resistance because the box can be perfectly tamper resistant, but you can switch it off and then you don't pay, right? Or you can uh, spoof the GPS and say, I'm at home, I'm at home, I'm at home, and, and you are driving around, right? So um, even tamper resistance would not help in this case. So. Uh, you need to detect if people are using the system and reporting false, da false data and so on. And the way it's done is with uh, random spot checks. Right? So this is like uh, in the metro, you can typically go into the metro or the bus without, paying a, without buying a ticket, but once in a while there's a check, somebody comes and says, where's your ticket? And if you don't have the ticket, then you get a big fine. So this discourages people from not paying. Right? But this is a bit the same. It is based on non-interactive commitment schemes. So the provider sends, uh, the, the, the defines the policy, the pricing policy, so it will say this type of road, this time of the day, so this price per kilometer, okay? 
and uh, the, the box, the OBU, will sort of do the map matching, say, okay, this GPS point corresponds to this highway, this is a highway, so I'll, it's uh, 6 a.m., so I should pay price one per kilometer. So it puts this in a, in a commitment, which is somehow like a safe, and sends this safe, not continuously, because then you would have another problem, but at the end of the week or at the end of the month, sends this safe to the, to the provider. So the provider knows that you have been somewhere because you have these safes, but they don't know where. Right? And then at some point they are able to challenge you and say, you have been seen in the Namsestrat at 8.30 in the morning. Prove to me that you reported this and you paid for it. Okay? And then you can provide some crypto material that says, yes, I reported that, pay for it, and here's the key that you can open one of the safes and check that indeed I had reported that and paid for that. And then the commitments are homomorphic in the sense that you, you can aggregate them encrypted. And um, so you aggregate and clear the prices and you get the fee for the end of the month. The provider can aggregate them encrypted and you provide some cryptographic material so that they can check that the fee that you're reporting, this month I have to pay 30 euros, indeed corresponds to the sum of these individual prices that they cannot see. Okay. And then you have the random spot checks to detect and with this, you can basically uh, deal with uh, abuse, p potential abuse. Okay, so summar summary. So what are the, these two perspectives? And I want to emphasize, they are not the, like data protection and privacy technologies are two perspectives on privacy. You have more because the, you have also the perspective for, uh, that comes, for example, from human computer interaction in which privacy is very much about uh, perception, about people not regretting actions, about expectations being fulfilled, about, uh, uh, whether, for example, when you're sharing information in a social network, whether you have a good understanding of who will see it and you're able to make meaningful decisions and the system can assist you in making decisions. So that's a completely different perspective that I'm not covering here. Okay? I'm, I'm focusing only on these two. But just to give you an, a sense that when people talk about technologies for protecting privacy, they can be talking about completely different things based on completely different assumptions and with completely different goals, or, or completely, but quite different goals. Right? So if we recap, uh, with respect to data protection technologies, privacy is defined as the ability to determine acceptable data collection and usage. And the emphasis is really on usage. Uh, and this usage is articulated through policies. Who defines the policies depends. In some cases, might be the user through settings, not up in social networks. Or it can be the organization deciding on the, on the, the, the policy on you know, what information they use for what. What is the limitation uh, of fo the focus on, on usage is that there is no emphasis on minimizing the collection of data. So this approach does not really prevent in any way the creation of large databases that then you know, can be exploited in, 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 lots of, that, yeah, in lots of different ways. And then these trust assumptions, I, I think, are a big limitation as well, in the sense that uh, the organization is trusted to enforce these policies and to make the, ensure that they are not violated. But of course, this does not protect you against the organization because they are trusted. So if they, are, if they want to abuse the data, if they have incentives to abuse the data, then you know, this is not going to address uh, that kind of threat. And very often, uh, I find that data protection technologies, they try to sort of mimic offline systems online. Right? So it's really a, often a very, very direct translation of online systems to online, and they are usually also in combination, not only technology, but in combination with organizational uh, practices and rules. And uh, yeah, I mean, the problem of translating offline to online is that the properties really change in the sense that you have practical obscurity of line that you don't have online, and so on. Inference, for example, I, I'm not sure you can make them offline if you don't have like automated processing. So what about pets? In pets, privacy is really defined not as, uh, as the, as, uh, it, so in the other case, privacy is okay as long as the policy that specifies what is, pos what is okay and what is not okay is respected. Here, privacy is really defined as properties that are really hard-coded into the technology. So you first say, okay, this system to be privacy preserving needs to provide anonymity. And now I'm going to design a system that hard-codes this concept of anonymity and, and I'm able to like, check or verify that the anonymity properties are, are respected. And uh, there is a lot of about you know, these formally defined properties 
ensuring true security analysis that they really hold. Now, what is the limitation here? That the privacy definitions are very narrow, right? They are very, really reduced to, you know, a formula essentially being satisfied. Um, the focus is on not on usage, on, 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 on preventing abuse, but on preventing disclosure. The assumption is, once you disclose, you know, anything can happen, and there is no way you can, you can really have any guarantees that, uh, um, that your privacy is going, is not, that your data is not going to be abused. So the goal is to, to mitigate the, the risks by enabling services, by enabling functionalities without revealing information. And this is going beyond what um, intuitively we would think is possible in taking as reference the offline world. And, uh, and the limitation is, of course, that because there is this assumption that you cannot control data after disclosure, there is no protection that is provided to, to data after disclosure. So once you disclose something, you know, the techn you know, a bit is, like, okay, now it's your problem. You've made this decision, you hopefully know what you're doing, but uh, the, the technology is not going to protect you anymore. And the truth is, in, in some cases, disclosure is necessary, desirable. So we also need to have protection of the type that the data protection technologies offer. And then, uh, in contrast to having the organization you're interacting with as a completely trusted entity, here the idea they, they is considered adversarial, and you want to not try to minimize the trust that you have to put in them. Um, and of course, if they have security properties such as you should not be able to cheat, or you should pay the correct price, or you should not be able to, you know, pretend to be somebody else, of course, the technologies have to guarantee. Uh, it's not about balancing, it's really about satisfying simultaneously the two types of properties. And the limitation here is that, of course, this is in direct conflict very often with uh, business models that are based on uh, getting value out of, of data. And also it transfers, so you, you try to minimize the trust in the other entity, but you transfer the trust of the, te the technology in a way. Right? So your privacy is now protected because this technology is functioning as expected and is, you know, secure and there are no ways to, to break the properties. So this is also tricky and even more because sometimes if the technology is broken or not working, it's sometimes not so easy to detect that that, that is the case, especially for an end user. In terms of deployment, of course, data protection technologies are much more uh, popular, much more deployed because compliance is a strong driver. So uh, people have businesses or organizations and they say, okay, we need to be complying with data protection and therefore um, there is a, a big incentive to, to implement uh, data protection technologies. Uh, the other the privacy technologies, uh, they is a very active and exciting area of research and there are many solutions that have been proposed but the deployment is very poor in part because you know, often they require um, entities to make an effort in investing in, in these technologies while it's not really in their interest to, to do so. So yeah, to conclude, uh, privacy is very broad, very subjective, it can be defined in many ways. This is even only from a sort of technical perspective, with a bit of a legal perspective, but if you talk to people who do psychology or who do law or who do other, other things, who look at privacy from other perspectives, they will talk about it in a very different way. And uh, as I said, there is a whole range of privacy technologies out there. Uh, people will say, yeah, this technology is good for your privacy, but what does it mean? It's not clear, it's not obvious immediately. So when you are confronted with a privacy technology and when you need to select a privacy technology, there are some useful questions that uh, I think you should consider. So first of all, what is the implicit or explicit definition of, of the privacy problem that is addressed? So how is the, pro the privacy problem framed? Is it about abuse? Is it about disclosure? Is it about surveillance? Is it about you know, uh, hackers getting uh, access and to your credit card and then stealing your money? What sort of problem are we talking about? And who defines what privacy is? So is it the policy? set by the organization that says if the policy is respected, privacy is okay. Is it the technology itself? The designer of the technology says this is a technology for privacy because it provides anonymity or it provides, you know, uh, this, it conceals uh, your activities and so on. So who defines what the privacy is in the technology? 
what are the trust assumptions not only related to entities that you that might play a role in the system but also with respect to the technical infrastructure that is available so for example uh, in credentials there is this assumption that there, are, there is an anonymous channel underlying because otherwise the technology doesn't work um, and what is the, the type of threat? Is it about surveillance or profiling or disclosure to the public or, or your mother finding out that you're gay or whatever? And then what is the level of assurance? So that, does it come, is, 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 is it a type of technology that has a security analysis that has, you know, uh, uh, that says, okay, in, you know, given an adversary with this and this and these capabilities, we can guarantee the security properties or is it, uh, that, or maybe does not provide that kind of guarantee. I think that's it. Okay, I have something else there that I cannot see. Yeah. What is the scope of the solution and what are the orthogonal aspects? So, of course, the privacy problem is always very big. So, you're never going to have one technology that addresses all the aspects. So, it's also important to see uh, what is left out. Right? So, for example, you can have technologies for anonymity but that doesn't really necessarily address the profiling problem or discrimination problems that might arise from profiling in the sense that you can do profiling on anonymized data <coughs> you can make even let's say that this data is uh, lower quality or is uh, there is less linkability in it or, or whatever but that doesn't mean that you cannot make decisions based on those profiles that might affect people negatively right so this is for example not addressed uh, by uh, technologies that uh, try to provide anonymity. What, the fact that you're anonymous doesn't mean that you cannot be infringed upon in terms of privacy. So always think, like, what is left out? So that's it. Okay, uh, so, so continue. Thank you. Any questions? I don't know if we have much time. I think I consumed. It's over. Yeah. Five minutes. I have two questions. What is your, uh, yeah, are we improving biotics or is my perspective that I think it's getting worse and worse? Do you think we can have a little better in five years or do we? So it depends what, what you're referring to with privacy, right? I mean, if you're yeah, referring... Uh, yeah, exactly. So let's say for the user, yeah. the point of view of somebody who's filing or... Yeah. So, yeah. so if you're referring to surveillance, I think it's really getting worse and it's very difficult to actually... I mean, there are really nice technologies out there that can be used to sort of counter surveillance, but um, in the end... Uh, they will only be used by people who have specific concerns. Uh, so there are people who have very good reasons to, to pay in terms of performance or in terms of uh, functionality to achieve uh, counter surveillance uh, properties. But I don't think the general public is going to be protected and I think that it's going to be, be more and more pervasive, right? Now, if you're talking about things like social privacy, which is a completely different issue like and very often when people talk about privacy problems today they take examples of people getting fired because they posted on Facebook that their boss is an idiot or things like that I do think that for these things we will sort of it, find ways of, of dealing with uh, social privacy in a way that you know it does not become so much of a problem. And, and you can see it like in, in Facebook, there are some recent studies that show that people have really learned a lot about how to configure the settings. They do modify the settings much more than a few years ago, and they are much more careful about what they, what they reveal to whom. So this is also a bit of a learning process. And yeah, it really depends on what angle you're taking. But yeah, with respect to surveillance, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>